I'm truly honored to make this introduction today. Adam Putnam was elected to serve as the Florida's Commissioner of Agriculture in November of 2010. In this capacity, he's the leader of the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. He's a fifth generation Floridian who grew up in the citrus and cattle industry. He understands Florida's generational challenges and in his role as Commissioner of Agriculture, Commissioner Putnam is focused on protecting the quantity and quality of the state's water supply, securing a stable, reliable and diverse supply of energy, expanding access to Florida's abundance of fresh produce and fostering the growth and diversification of Florida agriculture. He is a member of Florida's cabinet, serving alongside the governor, the attorney general, the chief financial officer. He oversees 13 boards and commissions and departments in his service. Previously, Commissioner Putnam served five terms as a congressman for Florida's 12th congressional district of the U.S. House of Representatives. He was recognized as a leader in a variety of issues, including water, and energy, and government transparency and efficiency. Commissioner Putnam was acknowledged for his efforts to bring comprehensive restoration to the Everglades, reform food safety laws, modernize programs to ensure Florida agriculture remains a leader throughout the nation, and increase access to fresh fruits and vegetables to counter childhood obesity. While in Congress, Commissioner Putnam was elected by his peers to serve as the Republican policy chairman during the 109th Congress and chairman of the House Republican Conference for the 110th Congress the highest elected leadership position any Floridian of either party has held in Washington. Commissioner Putnam also serves as a member of the House, served as a member of the House Committee on Government Reform, Agriculture, Rules and Financial Services. Before he was elected to Congress and before he served in the, House, uh, the Florida House of Representatives from 1996 to 2000, and before he graduated from the University of Florida with a Bachelor of Science degree in Food Resource and Economics, he was a member of the 4-H Club of Florida and served in a leadership role there. And as a former County Extension Director, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that. Commissioner Putnam and his wife, Melissa, have four children, and he's here to talk to us today about what's going on in Tallahassee. Commissioner. Well, thank you very much. It is, uh, it's been a few years since I was at this club. I think it's uh, Dan Miller invited me to this club probably eight or ten years ago. And, uh, and so it's been too long. I was beginning to take offense that I had uh, said, said something inappropriate the last time I was here. No matter how many Kiwanis clubs you go to, the, um, the singing's always bad. <laughs> and there's always beef tips over rice. I mean, I, it's... it's we used to have Kiwanis songbooks on the table. Apparently there's a Kiwanis recipe book as well that, that uh, it's like the governor's project. Everybody gets beef tips and rice. But uh, I just, uh, before I get into the, the substance of, of, of my remarks, I just want to thank you for, for what you do a, as Kiwanians. Uh, my grandfather, uh, when he passed away, we, we buried him with either a 50 or 55 year perfect attendance pin. It was just incredible. And, and what I remember most about that uh, wasn't that every Friday at noon he was at the Bartow Kiwanis. It was his makeups at the Key Club. And, and I just remember thinking how cool it was when I was, you know, 16, 17 years old in Key Club that my grandfather came to the Key Club meetings. And, 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 there, and there would be a handful of business leaders from around town sitting in that room and they would laugh and cut up and crack jokes and and it was a generational exchange that y you didn't get in any other setting and uh, and, I, and I think that's pretty special and so I just want to thank um, thank you as Kwanians for for what you do for Hobie and for Key Club and for other things to, to really nurture in young people uh, leadership opportunities and mentoring experiences even even when they don't know that, that it's an educational opportunity. You sort of sneak up on them. And so I just want to thank you for that. A uh, couple of things about uh, agriculture in the state. Uh, one of the things I really try and spend a lot of my time doing is getting around the state, reminding urban audiences the, the economic importance of agriculture in our state. There's a, there's a sort of a broad cultural support for agriculture as a aesthetically pleasing, bless their heart, 
Don't we love it when we smell the orange blossoms in the spring? Isn't it neat to see cattle out there? Isn't it charming when they load hay bales? But to really remind people that this is a $100 billion industry for our state. And interestingly, in some of our more urban counties, agriculture is the largest. So you take a county like Miami-Dade, agriculture's a billion dollar a year economic impact because they're, they're producing really high value products. Orchids, I mean, you, you go into these greenhouses that are acres and acres under, under cover and they're producing orchids that'll be sold for an awful lot of money and they're guaranteed uh, that the American consumer will kill them within about six weeks and then they'll go buy another one. <laughs> it's a fantastic business model. Uh, and, and tropical fruits and, and, of course, as Commissioner of Agriculture in a state where we grow 300 different things, there's never a dull moment. So I get to go to Apalachicola Bay and make sure that the oysters are safe to eat, and I check them personally for all of you. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, you, get, you pull the avocados and the mangoes and the papayas out of uh, Homestead and, of course, citrus and strawberries and blueberries. Uh, Hillsborough County, which of course just finished hosting the Republican convention, a big deal. Everybody gets excited about that. They've hosted Super Bowls in the past. Everybody gets excited about hosting a Super Bowl. Agriculture in Hillsborough County is the economic equivalent to a Super Bowl per month. Uh, Palm Beach County, you know, when you think of Palm Beach, you think of the breakers, you think of Worth Avenue, you, you think of these uh, shops. And yet on the other side of the turnpike, turnpike uh, is so much agriculture that Palm Beach County shares uh, a top 10 list of agricultural value counties in the country with places like Napa and Sonoma and other counties that you may have heard of in terms of the value of agriculture coming off that property. And so uh, even in the boom times, agriculture is our second largest industry. And as commissioner, we have, I wear a couple of different hats. You have this Ag, you know, sort of the farmer-in-chief role. You have the consumer services role, which uh, stretches from um, issuing gun permits, and the state of Florida will soon uh, uh, surpass one million active uh, concealed weapons permits, and weights and measures and gas pumps and things like that. And then you have this cabinet role, which is, um, which is really unique in the country. We're the only state that still has uh, a cabinet that operates exactly like ours does. It's, it's very reconstructionist, frankly. It's, it's an outgrowth of, of the Civil War, uh, where every other week the Attorney General, the Ag Commissioner, the CFO, and the Governor meet collectively, sort of like a county commission would, and collectively uh, oversee banks, insurance companies, uh, the, uh, the state pension fund, state lands, Department of Revenue, Highway Safety, Motor Vehicles, Florida Department of Law Enforcement, sort of a whole host of things, even clemency and pardons, which in any other state would be in front of the governor, comes in front of a panel of, of elected officials in the state of Florida. So it's a, it, it's, a, it's a lot more fun to be the Commissioner of Agriculture in Florida than it is in, say, Iowa or Nebraska, where they only care about corn, wheat, hogs, and soybeans. But our challenges are different as well because we, uh, you know, we, we live in a, in a tropical, subtropical state, so pests and diseases are frequently the biggest challenge agriculture faces. Uh, right now, for example, in, um, in Hialeah and Kendall and the outskirts of Miami, we have people literally crawling around house to house on their hands and knees picking up giant African land snails, which grow to be nine inches in length, four inches in diameter. They eat the stucco off your house. They feed on 300 different uh, plant varieties. And they, uh, and they, call, they, uh, they carry a lungworm that causes meningitis in humans. And they were brought into the United States. They were smuggled in as part of a um, Santerian uh, r religious r ritual. And so when we sent the teams down there to eradicate the giant African land snail, we had this um, like voodoo curse put on our office with a, <laughs> uh, a baby goat's head uh, uh, at, at our front door. And of course, we were I, not being familiar with having a curse put on me. I was quite taken back, but I was told by attorneys and judges in South Florida that those are routinely on the steps of the courthouse every Monday morning. So <laughs> that's, uh, th those are part of the, uh, the trials and tribulations of, of being in a state as interesting as the state of Florida. But when, when I came into this, and, and, and I, 
I left Washington, I like to think, with my soul and my sanity still intact, sister. Uh, it was, uh, it, Washington, unfortunately, is just so dysfunctional, and, and to be back, back home in Florida full-time and be able to accomplish things is so rewarding and gratifying because Florida's got a lot going for it, but there's a lot of things we need to focus on. And I've really focused on, uh, on a couple of key areas for our state. The first one is water. Uh, because water, in my opinion, is the biggest long-term issue facing Florida. Uh, whether your uh, objective in life is to build a subdivision, to plant an orange grove, or to save the Everglades, its future will be determined by water quantity and water quality in our state. And everywhere in Florida is now facing various degrees of scarcity. There was a time when people thought, well, We'll just build a pipeline and, uh, you know, take all of North Florida's water and bring it down to South Florida. They're out of water also. In fact, the oysters that I referenced in Apalachicola Bay, that industry is in a, is in a total collapse uh, because of inadequate water flowing into Apalachicola Bay from Georgia and Alabama because the Corps of Engineers won't let enough fresh water come down, and so the salinity is rising in the bay and killing the oysters. Jacksonville and the Suwannee Valley are fighting over what's causing the springs to dry up. The Tampa Bay area, of course, is the original epicenter of water wars in Florida. Orlando's fighting with Orange County, who's fighting with Brevard County, who's fighting with Deseret Ranch over a reservoir and, and new water supplies in central Florida. And, of course, Lake Okeechobee is really the, um, the, 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 the key to water supply issues in South Florida. Water supply for the glades, water supply for the tribes, water supply for agriculture, water supply for uh, the estuaries and, and other needs. And so as Floridians, this is something to really pay attention to because you can't afford to wait until it's a crisis to begin fashioning legislative solutions to it. But yet it's hard to build legislative momentum for something that's not a crisis yet. They, you know, people want credit for solving a problem. You don't get credit for the problem that you avert. And that's a real issue in terms of thinking about what water policy ought to be. But investing in alternative water supplies, uh, water farming uh, is something that we have uh, experimented with in the northern Everglades where you're essentially paying ranchers to hold water back on their land. You know, for 100 years we've cut ditches and canals and the objective was to get water off your property as quickly as possible. Now they agree to hold that water on and it's much more cost effective for the taxpayer than some of the more heavily engineered solutions of reservoirs. And you're, in, in, in your, you're netting out the same volume of water that's available in those wet periods to redistribute during the dry periods. And it's frankly better for the environment. So there's some options like that that we're very focused on, but as Floridians, water is going to be an issue that we need to continue to, to pay very close attention to. The second issue that uh, it, it, it's an expansion of the stereotype of being a uh, commissioner, and, and, and we love to shatter stereotypes because, um, you know, the, the bar is always so low, but when you think about nutrition uh, and, and the school lunch program in Florida, this is something that we've uh, spent a lot of time on, and we grow 300 different things in Florida, and nearly every single thing that we grow in Florida, your mother would be proud for you to eat. Uh, it's good for you, and when we grow it coincides with the school year. We, all of our peak production tends to be in the fall and winter and early spring. And yet, and yet, you know, when you go to a school, you might see tater tots and ketchup on the plate, and they call it a starch and a vegetable. Well, in a state like Florida, that's unacceptable. And more, this is not a Michael Bloomberg approach to managing your life. This is a fiscally thoughtful uh, way of supporting local businesses and helping our kids. Think about this from the, from the standpoint as, as taxpayers. This is the school lunch program in Florida is a billion dollar program per year. It feeds nearly three million students a day, every day, for 180 days a year plus summer feeding. And as taxpayers you pick up the tab for half of that because of the free and reduced lunch meal program. So you're, you're significantly invested in what you're serving young people. And you're developing habits that 40, 50, 60 years later, you will again support through Medicaid and Medicare 
where 60 percent of our health care costs are managing diet related illnesses. If we can adjust the habits on the front end by providing healthy options, which Florida grows in abundance, then maybe down the road we can begin to bend that cost curve. And we're managing it more like a business. When we ask the legislature to give us responsibility for that, we had the support of the school boards, we had the support of the School Nutrition Association, we had the support of pediatricians and the United Way and a whole bunch of folks who understood that we weren't getting it right in the past and there was, that we could do better. So from the social standpoint, our kids are eating better and they have options. From an economic standpoint, we're buying more from Florida. Instead of shipping everything to the Northeast, the berries and citrus and things that are good for you and that kids like to eat are finding their way into the school system. And because we're now running one procurement for fresh fruits and vegetables instead of 67 different procurements for fresh fruits and vegetables, we're saving money. The power of purchasing, running it like a business that people always talk about and seldom achieve. And so the nutrition piece to me represents a, a great opportunity to improve kids' health. We all know that hungry kids can't study, they can't concentrate, they're not going to do well on their FCAT, they're not going to make great grades. But we put healthy items on that tray that were produced right here in Manatee County or in Hillsborough County or in the Glades or on the Muck, and we're saving money and changing lives. And that to me is an example of what a 21st century role for a Department of Agriculture looks like focusing on resource issues, focusing on energy issues, and focusing on nutrition issues. And those are the types of things that we have been focused on. There's also an international aspect of this because what we grow here is sold around the world. We're now selling Florida products in 120 different countries. We opened up in India and Singapore last year. The South Korean Free Trade Agreement has opened up enormous new opportunities for agriculture, uh, particularly beef. They're buying a quarter of a million cartons a year of Florida grapefruit. In fact, when the ship comes into the port of Jacksonville delivering Toyotas from Asia, it's reloaded with grapefruit to go back to Asia. So the notion that agriculture is always low-tech, old McDonald's farm is just flat wrong. It is a part of a global trade network that is making sure that we're not deadheading automobile ships. We're as interested in what the expansion of the Panama Canal means to Port Manatee, Port of Tampa, Port Canaveral from an agricultural perspective as your port director is in terms of new businesses and new jobs. Because it represents an opportunity as a growing middle class around the world can afford what we grow, our finished products, our beef, our citrus, these are not cheap commodities. These are, these are middle class aspirations. Then those trade opportunities begin to mean more and more to Florida producers because we're providing a higher value, higher quality product than selling corn by the ton. That's the type of international influence that Florida agriculture is now impacted by and, and the things that we seek to continue to influence. But it's all really driven by a continued focus on research and development because we're not going to be the low cost producer of food compared to Brazil or India or China. That's not what will allow agriculture in Florida to be a hundred billion dollar industry. We have to continue to innovate. And so when you look at what our education system in the state of Florida produces, and particularly our higher education system through the land-grant university, the research and development that they do, that's what allows us to remain competitive. For example, if, we, if our number one crop in Florida was corn, there'd be 30 state universities doing research on corn. But because we're blueberries and strawberries and citrus and tropical fruits, there might be two other state universities looking at issues de dealing with that, California and maybe Texas and then us. And so if you want to continue to support a local $100 billion industry, we have to continue to support higher ed research and development. And if you knew that you could go steal or lure or recruit or poach a company that was worth as much to Florida as what agriculture already is, 
you'd roll out the red carpet, the governor would show up, the chamber would come out with those great big giant scissors and cut the ribbon. But that doesn't happen because agriculture is under the radar, it's quiet, it's not very sexy, it's not very glamorous. And yet, the research coming out of Florida educational institutions is transforming what Florida career opportunities using the land looks like. 20 years ago, there was no blueberry industry in the state of Florida. Today, it's a $60 million a year industry and growing by double digits every year. Today, because of research coming out of the state of Florida, people are pushing orange groves in some places and planting peaches. Today, because of research that came out of state university systems in, the, in Florida, nearly every strawberry grown in the dead of winter, when nobody else has strawberries, are varieties that were bred right here in this area. I mean, not just in Florida, but right here in your backyard. Right here in your backyard, you've got a $300 million economic impact from agriculture. And so shattering the myth of old McDonald's farm and preparing young people to be competitive in a life science, land-based, resource-intensive career path is a part of our mission because we believe that land use opportunities in Florida whether it's for water issues, for renewable energy issues, for food, for fiber, for nursery, to landscape new subdivisions. All of those things are part of a land use equation rooted in opportunities in the state of Florida. And so those are the kinds of things that we focused on in the last two years as, as your commissioner. And, uh, and I, to me, that's the shift that's been required for a long, it's been a long time coming. That's the 21st century mission for a Department of Agriculture in the third largest state that's rapidly urbanizing. That's what that mission looks like given all of those challenges. Trade issues, international pest and disease issues, development issues, nutrition issues, energy and water type issues. That's what that mission looks like. And, uh, and it's been an awful lot of fun to work on these for the last two years and a whole lot more gratifying than, uh, than what we did for 10 in Washington. You know, ob obviously this is a, a high priority of the governor and, and all of our elected uh, officials in the state. How do, we, how do we make the most out of other states uh, being in, in a worse economic condition even than Florida is? And g with all the problems in Florida, I'd rather be Florida with Florida's problems and Florida's potential than any other state. I'd rather be us than Ohio, given everything going on in in the auto industry. I'd rather be us than New York. I'd rather be, Lord knows I'd rather be us than California. Because when you look at what a December day in Florida looks like, when you, when you see the Gulf beaches, when you understand the low tax, low labor cost, all of the, all of the advantages of being in Florida, a lot of our challenge is more psychological than, than substantive, and, and by that I mean for many, many people, Florida is not a place where people live their lives and have to build things and create things and educate people, and it, it's a reward for a life well lived someplace else. I mean, they view Florida as a prize. And, and changing that mentality, and I think we've come a long way with particularly in life sciences with Scripps and with Torrey Pines and with Mox Planck, building on our natural advantages to lure talented faculty and talented uh, technology and innovators from places like California and manufacturing from the Rust Belt, although we've got a long way to go in terms of manufacturing in our state. Our real competition are our neighbors. I mean, how do you I mean, when people leave the Midwest or they leave the Northeast, they're going to look at Tennessee, they're going to look at Texas, they're going to look at the Carolinas, they're going to look at Florida. I mean, so we've got to be better than them, not better than Ohio. Everybody's better than Ohio. We've got to be better than the Southeast, you know? <laughs> and, um, and, and I think a lot of good work over the years has gone into that. John McKay certainly led the charge on economic development. But there's a certain element of that that is cultural and psychological of getting CEOs who own a home here and play golf here and spend, according to their CPAs anyway, six months and a day here, getting them to think about conducting their business here. 
And, and you know, nearly every major venture capitalist in the Northeast has a house in Florida, but we don't really have venture capital in Florida. That, that's the kind of thing that needs to be corrected by changing the, the mindset of what Florida is to, in the eyes of the business world. We're, we're, we've defined our brand as a place to visit, not a place to work and live. What happened to the tomato guys several years ago was just criminal. A, a federal employee with the Food and Drug Administration went on television in the midst of a food safety scare and publicly speculated. They, they guessed on national television what might have caused the illness. And they said, we think it might have been tomatoes. And so, of course, people stopped eating tomatoes, even tomatoes that hadn't been picked when the outbreak occurred. And, and so it, it killed the whole year. It killed the whole season all through the southeast for a problem that was later found to have been imported Mexican peppers. And, uh, and, and so that was a reckless, uh, I would say, crim criminal uh, speculation on, on the news, which if they had, if they had, if someone from the Federal Reserve had publicly speculated or Treasury had publicly speculated about looming charges against a, uh, an auto manufacturer or an airplane manufacturer and their stock had crashed, there would have been lawsuits all over the place. But which individual farmer is going to be able to, to generate that type of a legal case against the Food and Drug Administration of the federal government? But that's exactly what happened, and, and it was, uh, we worked on trying to correct that in, in the Congress and got nowhere. Uh, if, if I heard all of, all of your question, what percentage of the food in, in, that's grown in Florida is, is genetically engineered, and, and what's the impact on your health? Is that? Uh, in, in terms of engineered through breeding nearly everything. I mean, uh, you know, citrus didn't exist in Florida until the Spanish discovered us, and we've been breeding different varieties of citrus for 500 years, and they taste different today than they did 500 years ago. Uh, tomatoes are the same way. So they're genetically altered through natural selection and breeding to express certain traits, which is what people have done for the, in the history of agriculture. In terms of um, manipulating genes to in, inject a certain type of um, weed-resistant uh, variety or things like that, such as what we've seen in, in the Midwest, very little to, to almost none. Uh, that just hasn't been something that fresh fruits and vegetables have done or needed to do. But I will say this, to feed 9 billion people by 2050, we're feeding 7 billion now, some places better than others. We overfeed in the civilized, in the Western world and we're still, we've got a billion people in, in a continent living on less than a dollar a day. Science is going to be the only thing that will allow us to, to have the productivity and the yield to feed 9 billion mouths. And if we fail to feed 9 billion mouths, you're going to have wars over resources, which is what mankind has fought over up until the last 100 years when we've been fighting over ideas. And, and, and that's unacceptable. It will take another green revolution to feed that many people. And, um, and, 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 and it's going to come about through those types of, of of advances in science that give us the yield. I mean, in, in the 1930s and 40s, most of the American population was somehow connected to the land. Today, it's one and a half percent. And yet, 20% of what we grow in America is exported to some other country. The only way you've had that kind of yield, the only way you've had that kind of productivity is through science. And, and we're going to have to continue that pace of science because it's hard enough to find a percent and a half of the population who wants to farm. To the extent that the, that the federal government adopts policies addressing uh, warming or, or climate change in general, it will have an effect on the competitiveness to continue to be engaged in agriculture. In terms of knowing which areas will become more agriculturally productive if, if there are rising temperatures versus becoming less agriculturally productive due to rising temperatures. I don't think anybody's ever gotten that specific. Uh, but the, 
in terms of the real world today implications of that debate on Florida farmers, it, uh, it, it really manifests itself in demands by retailers. And in a lot of cases, what farmers are doing is less because it's what the state government or the federal government is demanding that they do, and more it's because it's what Walmart is demanding that they do. And, and you're certainly seeing at the corporate level where they drive towards greater sustainability, you're seeing uh, producers having to justify the amount of, of um, what their water footprint is in producing a crop and what their carbon footprint is in producing a crop. And several years ago, uh, certainly your, your, your neighbor here in, in Manatee County, uh, PepsiCo, uh, for Tropicana did a study to see what the carbon footprint of a half gallon of orange juice was. Well, that's, that got farmers' attention. It, it doesn't matter what you think the federal government ought to do on cap and trade or on global warming, or it doesn't matter whether you think it's happening or not. If your number one buyer thinks it's happening and they're telling you to take certain steps, then that's what you're going to do. And so that was, that was a big moment in terms of uh, Florida agriculture recognizing that, that these larger sustainability trends from their, from their biggest buyers were going to affect on-farm operations. Thank you. Well, Commissioner, it's my pleasure to present you with uh, Kiwanis Golden Rule to continue to measure your future success with. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate thank you very that. Much.